Welcome to another episode of the Geotechnical Engineering Podcast. It's a podcast focused on helping geotechnical engineers stay up to date with technical trends in the field. I'm your host, Jared Green, and I've practiced as a geotechnical engineer for over 17 and a half years. And in addition to practicing engineering, I enjoy mentoring young engineers and first-generation college students. I've focused on helping to increase the number of pre-college students that are interested in STEAM majors and fields. STEAM meaning science, technology, engineering, art, and mathematics. In this episode of the Geotechnical Engineering Podcast, which I may sometimes refer to as the Geopod, I'll be talking with none other than Dr. Sam Clemens, a professor at Syracuse University, about his role as a professor at the university and the things that he does to help geotechnical engineers and students succeed. Before we jump in, let me remind you that you can find everything you need at the following website, geotechnicalengineeringpodcast.com. There you will find links to the past shows and links to subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. And there's also a form where you can submit topics and guest ideas. Again, that's geotechnicalengineeringpodcast.com. And please, if you've enjoyed the show, please consider leaving a review on Apple Podcasts as doing so will help more geotechnical engineers find the show. Now, let's jump into our conversation with Professor Sam Clements. All right, welcome to another episode of the Geotechnical Engineering Podcast. Uh, we have our guest today, Professor Sam Clemens. Welcome to the Geotechnical Podcast. We are honored to have you, Professor. Jared, thank you. Thank you so much for including me in this wonderful program. I really, really appreciate it. Oh, man, this is a, a, it's kind of like a moment of personal pride because you were my first soil mechanics professor at Syracuse over 20 years ago. You believe that? Wow, wow. <laughs> I, actually, I remember. I was going to include a little bit about that. Oh, my goodness. I, I, no, I remember teaching you <laughs> Uh, foundation engineering and design and at the beginning of the semester you were you were okay but you didn't seem to be tuned in and then one day we talked after class and you had this little gleam in your eye and I thought oh we've got him he's gonna be a great geotechnical engineer and uh -huh. sure enough that happened I'm so uh -huh. proud we're all so proud of your accomplishments so thank you so much that means a lot that means a lot yeah at first I didn't know what was going on so as a particulate yeah. matter I was like what is going yeah. on <laughs> Uh, that's right. That's true. It's uh, very different from structures and uh, a lot of the other civil uh, specialties. You're right. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> uh -huh. Wow. Well, we gave an uh, introduction, went over your bio earlier in the show, but like if we had to say it in your own words, what would you tell the listeners your daily life is like at Syracuse University? And I, right. And you've been uh, here since late 70s. So right. daily yeah, life yeah. probably changed over the years. But yes, it has. Say? You know, I've been here. Uh, let's see. Wow. 43 winter, winters, we counted as winters. <laughs> I'm from Atlanta, Georgia originally, but 43 years. I retired in 1914 and um, I still continue to- 1914? Uh, uh, so, I'm sorry, 2014. Okay, just check it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Cut that out, would you play? That's a blooper. Um, but um, I've still continued to be active in the department and I assist with the senior design course which is a wonderful, wonderful experience. We, we really have one of the oldest senior design courses in the country. Almost 60 years ago, we started it. It was called planning engineering in those days, but it's really a wonderful capstone design course. And I think it's something that uh, I love to teach because it, it gives students that are not necessarily great analytical performers, but are good designers, a chance for them to uh, excel. And it's always wonderful to see students that, you know, maybe not the smartest kids in the class, but the ones that know how to design and get excited with teamwork and uh, work well together and come up with a good project. So that's, uh, I do that. I review papers uh, for several professional societies, uh, help in the office, help in the department any way I can. So it's good. Oh, that's great. That's great. And I remember the capstone design. That was a lot of fun, it, you know working with somebody to focus in the civil, somebody to focus in environmental, focus in the structure. And the reality is that that capstone was a preview of what 
you know, the daily life would look like as a consultant, because we work with different consultants all the time, different disciplines. Well, thank you. That's, a, that's what we hope to, uh, to do, to, to simulate. And then the wonderful thing is at the end, we have a presentation where we have engineers uh, come, prominent engineers like Jared Green come and visit <laughs> and listen to the seniors present their, their projects and you ask wonderful questions. You prepare them for that real life experience. And so we, we, I'd love to do it. I hope I can maybe be hobbling in there for the next couple of years to continue to do it. <laughs> Sounds awesome. I, I also saw a video that uh, Syracuse posted, I believe it was from last year where it showed, I think there were freshmen or sophomore students that had prepared bridge designs and they had to step on them. And one of the things I thought was so powerful is that you would step on the bridge with right with the designer right, and sometimes right, sometimes yeah. you'd stay and other times you guys would you know come down to 18 inches but I I thought that was pretty awesome yeah yeah that was a lot of that was a freshman course and uh, okay. we would give them a limited amount of material and they had to support 300 pounds and uh it was fun yeah they, i think it really uh sort of brought home uh, not just the theoretical part but practical application you got to build something that's going to stand up and take the load so they get a visual <laughs> visual idea if it doesn't perform well yeah. and everybody's watching too which which makes yeah it that's right fun. yeah we do that at the end of the semester yeah <laughs> oh that's great well professor i know that you served as a naval officer in the u.s navy civil engineering corps and i want to thank you for your service thank you uh, what would you say how did that you know experience oh, benefit your career yeah that was a wonderful adventure number one and number two it it really turned me into a man i really recommend it for anybody that <laughs> <laughs> gets out graduates and doesn't know what to do boy it just it, what they do is they take you they train you and they put you in big big positions of uh, responsibility okay. and uh, i mean it, it was amazing i was uh, in the in the cbs they call it construction battalion a naval construction battalion of about 1,200 men. And after I had finished and gotten my uh, commission, we went through training and then we went to Guam. There'd been a typhoon that had gone through there. So we went to repair a lot of the works there. It, interesting geotechnical project there was a warehouse right along the wharf in Guam. And we had to drive steel piles down because the hurricane or the typhoons, they call them out there, the wind pressure and uplift. And so we were driving them into crystallized coral, and it was really interesting stuff. You'd, you'd get a real high blow count, and then bam, it suddenly would break through the coral and drop a few feet. Wow. So we had to drive them pretty deep and uh, get them into where there was enough skin friction for us to be able to ensure that we had the uh, uplift capacity for these typhoon-type winds. Uh, and after, actually, the Great Alaska earthquake occurred while we were out there, and we thought a tsunami would hit us, but it missed Guam and but hit Hawaii. Wow. And while we were there, uh, we got called up to go into Vietnam. It was at that time when that became very, very active. And uh, uh, so I went in with an advanced party and we did, that was combat engineering, very different from uh, regular engineering. You know, you're, <laughs> you've got people shooting at you. You've got to be careful what you're doing. You've got to always be ready to, to uh, grab your weapon and uh, protect yourself. And, wow. Uh, yeah, that was, that was, it was exciting. And then probably I'm going on about this, but I, I this is no, wonderful. Fine. Uh, the, probably the best adventure I had was um, I had a CB team, they call it, uh, took 12 enlisted men and, and an officer. And I was a young guy. I was an ensign, I guess, when I went. And they sent us up into Northeast Thailand uh, to build a dam, a road, and a bridge. The, uh, the communists were coming across the Mekong River and uh, they had this aid, U.S. aid program where we wanted to show that, you know, we were supporting the people. So we convoy up there with bulldozers and scrapers <laughs> and all this equipment. And we had about 30 or 40 Thai, young Thai men to help us. And uh, we built this road and um, we had, it was actually, the material was interesting. It's laterite. Hmm. I don't know if you've, you've heard that term, maybe. Oh. It's a residual soil. It's kind of like low-grade iron ore. It's red. <laughs> Uh, and I remember even when I was in a master's at Georgia Tech, uh, George Sowers, who was a wonderful professor, had talked about laterite. So I scooped, I got a big box of it and mailed it back to him at Georgia <laughs> Tech. I don't know if he appreciated it or not, but uh, we had to compact the road and we didn't have a water truck. So we took a big old Connex box, it's a big steel box, mm -hmm. turned it on its side and put it on a three quarter ton truck and cut a hole in the box and put a pipe on there and a water spreader and 
<laughs> you know, got the optimum moisture content for this stuff. So it was, you know, it was really, you had to really do sort of innovative things to, to complete the project. We had to hire some elephants to snake some timber out of the jungle to build a bridge. And so it was a great adventure. I, I loved doing it. And we built a dam and uh, we had a concrete spillway and it was so hot we had to pour concrete at night, you know, because it would get a flash set. Wow. And when the dam was about completed, we, the, the rainy season was going to start and we were worried about erosion on the dam. So I talked to the, the mayor of the city where we were. Is, they were called a Nyampur. And I said, look, let's make a deal. If you'll ask every family around here to bring about one square meter of sod, we'll provide water. If you'll provide some food, we'll have a big picnic and we'll sod the top of the dam to protect it from erosion. Wow. And we did. You know, about 100 families showed up. It was cool. I've that is so awesome. These, yeah, I've got these pictures with these people out there putting grass in, in the dam. You know, it survived the first year. I, uh, I never did go back. But uh, so that was, it was a wonderful, wonderful experience. And I loved every minute of it. That is so cool. You talk about having to, you know, gather the given information, dealing with constraints, you know, yeah. dealing with material challenges, equipment yeah. challenges, and then yeah. involving the community. That's a powerful yeah. experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it was really great. Yeah, so I loved it. <laughs> wow. Well, Professor, when I look at your uh, accomplishments and awards, you, you've won a lot. <laughs> you won a lot of awards, and a lot of them tie back to your excellence in teaching. I just, I just picked one from the bio. It said that uh, uh, one of the awards was in 1998. You got the Outstanding Educator Award from the St. Lawrence section of the American Society of Civil Engineers. Now, I would imagine an award like that comes from somebody that is passionate in what they do. Now, I had you as a, as a student, so um, as a student, I had you as a professor, so I know that you're passionate about what you do, but tell us more about why you wanted to be a professor, what, what that's meant yeah, to you. Yeah, thank you, Jerry. Yeah, actually, that award, I didn't know anything about that. The dean nominated me for that, the <laughs> dean of our college, and I was shocked. I was really grateful that he did that, yeah, but uh, it was wonderful. Yeah, I... I, um, I really came into teaching rather late because uh, I had co-op through Georgia Tech. I'd spent six or seven years in the Navy and took me a long time to get a PhD. And I really wasn't sure that I wanted to do it. But once I started teaching, I loved it. And I tried to make it practical. I tried to bring in practical examples. I think that's the value of, of going out into practice first and then teaching. You know, you, if you have some experience, I think the students appreciate that. So. Yeah. I love to do that. I, I'm kind of a visual learner, so I tried to, I've taken a lot of pictures as I've gone along, so I tried to reinforce concepts with visual ideas. Uh, and I just loved it. I, I love students. I love having students like you, somebody that, you know, you started, you didn't know if you wanted to be in geotech, but when you found that you liked it, it, it was just thrilling to me to see, you know, you, you take it and, and have all the wonderful accomplishments that you've done since then. That just makes my heart full to think about students like that. So, you know, it's, a, it's a, something that I love to do. I have to tell you, uh, the visual part, um, often I would talk about a concept, I don't know, compaction or permeability. Then I try to show some slides, you know, that I had some examples. So I, I had an 830 class, uh, typically, and one day I, I go to class and almost everybody's there right on time. There's a lot of people there earlier than me. And that's kind of suspicious, you know, but so I'd lecture going and about the last 15 minutes of the class, I'm going to show them slides. So I, uh, I shut down everything and I said, okay, we're going to show some slides. And I pulled the screen down and they had taped a centerfold of a Playboy bunny on the screen. And it said, hi, Sam, I love your Southern accent. <laughs> when I pulled down the screen to show the slides. So I was so flabbergasted. I, I couldn't, I, I just had to dismiss class, <laughs> but they knew I was going to show some slides. So they knew that I love to use visual learning. So it was fun. Yeah. That's uh, I think if you, if it's a profession that you love, just like you love your profession and you can just feel it when you uh, talk with people and work in it. So that's great. Oh, yeah. That's wonderful. And when you think about, uh, you think about your experience, you think about the good times, but what are some of the challenges that you had to overcome? Right, right, right. Um, in the beginning, teaching is, um, you don't get, you do have to make some sacrifices. You're probably not as well uh, paid for it, you know. 
often you don't get much recognition at the beginning. There's all this pressure to do research, mm -hmm. uh, and you get hit from all different sides for for research, for committee work, and it and it's it's funny that I don't think um, you know. I wish we had mentors. We I think I was department chair for a while. We tried to do more of that, but I think faculty need mentors as well as they do in the practice. I'm sure you had mentors when you got Definitely. out and started. Yes, yes, yeah. companies. Yeah. And uh, I think that uh, that was a part, you weren't sure what you, where you were supposed to spend your energy. Mm. Uh, and if you do too much in teaching and neglect your research, then you know, you're in, in jeopardy of not getting tenure. If you do too much research, uh, then you kind of become, you're not as excited about classwork. So it's a balance and it's something that you rest, have to feel your way along, especially in those times in the, uh, uh, in the 60s, you, People, there weren't people there to guide you along. So I think, I hope that's gotten better today. Yeah, mentorship is, is, is so key. I think yeah. that whether you're in an academic sense or if you're in the professional sense, if you're in the contract, if, if you don't have a mentor, you almost have to, you know, have find yourself. And it's right. really hard, you know, you know, you're the beginning of the forest and it's like, you got to make that path. It's very exactly. common. Exactly, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Wow. And, yeah. and as a professor, I mean, what, what are some of the ways that you think were instrumental in continuing to learn to stay on top of things as far as? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. What? Well, again, I think the professional societies do a great job of that. ASCE, mm -hmm. I was a committee chair for the Shallow Foundations Committee, uh, the Deep Foundations Institute. Get involved with those uh, institutes. You can go to seminars. You can learn things. I learned so much from some of the short courses there just going to meetings and um, meeting with colleagues, talking to other faculty and what they're doing. One of the other things I did, if, if anybody ever goes into education, I got, we had an accreditation review, you know, every mm -hmm. six years. And we had this guy that I was a department chair and he was such a nitpicker. Oh man, he made me so mad with the things that, you know, the little, little things he found wrong with, the, with our program. So I called up and complained and, and the guy says, well, why don't you become a evaluator? If you want to change the system, become one of them. So I actually did start uh, going to accreditation visits and it was eye opening. I, I went wow. to all different types of schools from small ones up to, I went to Stanford. I went to, you know, and you really gain a wonderful uh, sense of what others do in their educational programs. And that was a really great help to see how other, other people did approach their education a lot that's of good awesome. ideas came out yeah that's awesome and that's so important i mean if you you know lose your a bet accreditation i mean that's that's kind of yeah. it <laughs> yeah that's right so that's, that's right. very important yeah it's, yeah it's a very serious uh, uh program it's good. wow when you think back on your career i mean what are you what do you think were some of the big surprises when you think about the time as an educator um hmm. I, uh, I don't, I'm, that's hard to say. I don't know. I guess I'm surprised at how much today the computing, mm -hmm. uh, computing applications have taken over, how much that's used today. Right. And it's wonderful. And I agree with it, but I always, uh, in, in classes and graduate courses, always wanted the student, for instance, if they do a slope stability analysis and they use a computer program, I want a little hand check on, uh, exactly. you know, just a, we call it a gut check. I, yes. I, I, worked, I was a consultant for O'Brien and Gear for the geotechnical group. And they'd always say, okay, we need a gut check on this question here. So I, I was surprised at how much, I mean, we rely on it and it's great and finite elements are wonderful. And, uh, but I feel like uh, I, I was surprised. I, I think we still need to be more, Maybe that sounds old fashioned, but I think it's, we need to have a gut check when we do this type of work. So. Well, I, I agree. I mean, you can have all these colorful, you know, plots, but if yes, you really yes. know how to explain <laughs> what the soil should be doing, you can't yeah. check to see if it's right. Yeah. Even if you have, you know, 12 significant digits for how yes. much settlement's going to occur, it's like, <laughs> can you solve it on the back of an envelope is what we that's used to right. say, right? Yeah. That's right. That's <laughs> so true. Yeah. And I think that's, Stands people good stead, good stead. Uh, it's sort of good innate engineering sense, you know, mm -hmm. sort of what's the scale of things. Yeah. I used to have my graduate students read a paper by Ralph Peck about scale, you know, yeah. looking at a site. Somebody says, oh, there's 320,000 kip loads. Well, wait a minute, let's, are you sure that's right? I mean, yeah. you know, 
just <laughs> just have practical un, uh, understanding of scale and uh, quantity and uh, what's right. Like you said, with settlement, you bring it out to all those uh, all those uh, significant figures, and it's really not very valid. Yeah. <laughs> scale is so key. I I can remember as a as a young engineer, you show up at a site, client says it's going to be a you know seven acre site. You come there. And I said, what do you think? It's pretty big. I said, yeah, it looks like a seven acre site. I mean, that's what you said, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so you, said understand, you know, if you don't understand scale, it's like, yeah, yeah. how do you tie it back? You exactly. Know? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> now, another, another thing that I always think it's uh, great about your experience is that you tried to retire a few times. <laughs> Can you yeah. tell our listeners about that? Because oh, I think as a geotechnical engineer and a geotechnical <laughs> engineering professor, your retirement is pretty spectacular when you think about where, where, <laughs> yeah. what happened. But yeah, please very, share. You're very sweet, Jared. Yeah, let's see. 2014, I retired. I had a great party. I <laughs> gave a lecture on the history of engineering. But some of my students came back from all over the world. It was fun. So the chancellor called me uh, the next fall, and he said, you know, our, the dean of Hendricks Chapel, who is the religious leader on campus. Syracuse University was founded as a Methodist church, by the Methodist church a long time ago in the 1870s. And uh, we built this beautiful chapel right on the quad. As you remember, yes. in the surveying course, you had to <laughs> estimate the height of the chapel using yes. a triangulation. Yep. But anyway, he said, um, how would you like feel about being the interim dean of Hendricks Chapel? I said, Chancellor. <laughs> I'm, you know, I'm a Christian. I've got a little Christian group I advise, but holy moly. He says, you can do it. You can do it only for a few months till we find a replacement. Well, it turned out being two and a half years I served as a dean of Hendricks Chapel. It was wonderful because I got to see a whole nother aspect of the university community. There's a lot of support out there for students, you know, that, that are having problems. We have a food pantry. We developed a lot of programs to help people. So it was a 180 degree turn from engineering but but actually i think i think some of and we had we had uh, let's see 10 chaplains we had a tremendous we had a catholic uh um i don't i, I can't rehearse all of them but you know 10 different faith groups mm -hmm. and here's an engineer talking to him but i try to be logical i think they appreciated <laughs> that <laughs> but uh, we finally found a wonderful uh replacement and then about six months later he says calls me up again he says sam he says, we're starting an ombudsman program on campus to have a university ombudsman. How would yeah. you like to be the first, the interim university ombudsman? Only take a couple of months. He tells me the same story about finding it. <laughs> so I, I took that on and uh, I served in that for about a year and a half. Wow. And that was interesting too, uh, as an ombudsman, you know, it's an old Swedish term that uh, uh, the king, people were unhappy with the king of Sweden. So he appointed an ombudsman, a person that you could come to with complaints anywhere. There was no retribution. And so I would hear, it's amazing. You know, people would come with, with complaints. I couldn't do a lot about them, but I could kind of head them in the right direction and try to, and I had to report to him every month about what he, what, no names or anything, you know, all, mm -hmm. all uh, what do you call it? Um, secure, you know, no, 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 but what the temperature of the campus was, where were people unhappy? What could he do to help things? So it, it was quite an interesting position, and but I'm glad to be back now in a good old uh, senior design and uh, helping with that course. But that was fun. Yeah, it was really interesting. <laughs> that is cool. You talk about you know expanding the scope of practice. That's uh, yeah, right. <laughs> fantastic. Uh, it's just you know sometimes when you raise your hand and say yes, I can do it, you have to figure out how to do it. Yeah, and, right. Um, yeah, you've done that. I know you've done it. Yes, so sir. Many ways. But it <laughs> is. But it, it's. It takes a little courage, but it, it's really rewarding, I think, isn't it? You, it Agreed. opens up your mind. to. You've done that, I know, in so many different areas. Yeah, so it's, it's fun. It really was, yeah. Oh, that is great. Uh, when we think about, you know, diversity within what it means to be a geotechnical engineer, I know there was a time you taught a class about Leonardo da Vinci. I, yeah, I think that's just yeah, awesome. I know, I know and actually, I, I have a little shirt that, you know, gives a tribute to that. Yeah, oh, the divine fun. geometry, yeah. tying that back to pizza, yeah. right? <laughs> <laughs> I, I wish you'd been around for it. Um, I, I had a good, we had a Mellon Foundation project where we, we tried to integrate the arts and sciences with the professional schools. They, they seemed like there were separate entities, you know, engineering's over here, uh, law is here, uh, new uh, public communications. How do we integrate those with uh, arts and sciences? How do we get, you know, to get to know faculty? And so 
actually we had programs and I got to know a, a Renaissance art professor. And uh, I'd always been interested in the history of engineering. I tried to bring it into the class. And so he asked me to lecture on Roman engineering. He was teaching an introductory art course or, or hist art history. And he was talking about the Romans. So I, I did that. And then uh, we, I did a little bit about Leonardo da Vinci. So one day we were walking across the quad and he says, you know, I teach a course on Michelangelo. It's an art course. <laughs> and I, what I do is I teach the kids about Michelangelo. And then at spring break, we go to Italy and we see his works. He says, but you know, it's kind of boring as art students are okay, but I'd like to mix it up. I said, he said, let's do something on Leonardo da Vinci. I said, okay, we'll call it Leonardo da Vinci, artist and engineer. Nice. And so we, we made a proposal to the Dean of Engineering and Arts and Sciences and they each gave us several thousand dollars to support the kids at spring break. So, so here's the plan. So we would teach the course together he was a wonderful teacher. He was a lot better than me. So I had to really scramble. I mean, you know, he, he, he was one of these eloquent professors that speaks in paragraphs, you know, he talked about Leonardo's concept of the Mona Lisa and all this. So I had to really scramble to keep up with him. But um, so what we would do then, and we would stay in the class. It wasn't that he would teach one day and I wouldn't teach him. You know, I stayed with him, he stayed with me. He asked questions, I asked questions. And the students often said they loved it when we get in an argument about something that they could see. But then, so what we would do at spring break is we would we'd limit the class to about 25 students, half engineering, half arts and sciences. We'd gather them all up and fly to Florence and spend a couple of days there. And then we'd go up to Vinci where Leonardo was an illegitimate son of a notary. So his name means Leonard of Vinci, you know, he didn't have a last name. It was Leonardo of Vinci because he was born in Vinci. Wow. Beautiful little mountain town, <laughs> excuse me, right outside of Florence. So we'd go see where he was born. And then in Florence, we'd go visit his workshops. A lot of his paintings are there at the, um, uh, the uh, main art institute in, in Florence. Uh, what's that called? Um, anyway, we'd, we'd visit there. And then we'd fly, uh, we'd take a train up to Milano because the Last Supper is there. And that's a magnificent painting. It's been damaged and they only allow 10 or, let's see, 20 people in as a group for only 15 minutes at a time. It's all humidity and temperature mm -hmm. control. So we would uh, go into the, we'd visit that. And then Leonardo, at the end of his life, the King of France, Francis I, brought him to Amboise in France and had a house for him. And so Leonardo died there. So with the last few days, we'd go to Paris. We'd go to the Louvre because most of his paintings are there. The Mona Lisa's there. And then we go down where he, would, he, he died. So wow. we started in Vinci where he was born and ended up in Amboise where he died. Wonderful program. The kids loved it. We yeah. enjoyed it. And uh, it, I, we did it for about 10 years. And it was exhausting, though, to take for about 10 days of spring break. Yeah. But Leonardo, man, I mean, he anticipated... I mean, he, he understood geology. He says, how do you have these fossils up in the mountains? How did they get there? You know, and <laughs> amazing polymath, you know, your shirt, his mathematics, yeah. uh, his geometry is amazing. His, we, we actually have a copy of his, uh, some of his notebooks at uh, Syracuse University. We had to have to handle them with uh, gloves on, you know, we take <laughs> the students and let them see their replications of his drawings. And wow. They're just phenomenal. Wonderful, wonderful experience. Yeah. That is awesome. Those students are never going to forget that, you know? Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think so. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that is wonderful. So I guess, you know, our listeners are, you know, geotechnical engineers from, you know, folks that are in school and trying to figure out if they want to go on a geotechnical all the way up through practicing PEs and PhDs. Uh, what advice would you give them for staying technically sharp? Like, what are the things that geotechnical engineers should be doing consistently so they can stay sharp over the years? Right. Well, I mentioned th these are, I know you all know about these. They're, they're very, very good. Number one, I tell this to my students to join ASCE, join the profession. You're part of it. You need to support it. You need to be active in it. Mm -hmm. uh, one time... <laughs> I used to teach, well, when the freshmen uh, and the seniors, we'd have a, a part of the course was on ethics or, uh, you know, proper professional conduct. And uh, I would always say, we'd have some examples and I'd say, make sure that you um, join the ASC because they can help you with these problems. 
Yeah. And so about, oh, I don't know, 10 years ago, I have a student call me up and he says, he says, I graduated uh, in civil engineering. And he says, I went into the rock business. He was a, what do you call those people that help set up rock shows? Uh, I don't know there's a name for him anyway, but he's a grunt, you know, said, and he <laughs> says, I'm, I'm down in New York City and we're setting up this rock concert in this warehouse in older part of New York City. And some of these, they were um, uh, steel beams up there, steel, steel beams. Okay. And some of them were really corroded. Okay. And uh, he says, I'm worried. He says, I went, we're hanging heavy speakers from these. So mm. it's an engineering problem, but he's a grunt, you know, <laughs> he doesn't know what to do. So we go to his boss and he says, you know, I'm worried about these steel beams up here. They're those joists, you know, welded yeah. bar joists. Okay. And, uh, and the guy said, don't you tell me about that. We're putting a concert in. I want to lose any money. You know, he, he blows them off. <laughs> and he says, well, I need to tell the owner. And he says, you do, you're fired. So wow. he's caught, you know, between notifying yeah. this or not. So he calls me up. I didn't want to. <laughs> now so, you're involved. Yeah, I know it. I said, <laughs> yeah, I said, uh, I've forgotten his name. He said, I said, contact ASCE, the headquarters are right there. You get a hold of their legal department yeah. and they'll help you out. And sure enough, they, they guided him through. He wrote a letter. They, he wrote a letter and wow. presented it to his boss and to the owner to sort of protect himself. From that. Yeah. But I don't, I'm sorry I got off onto that. But anyway, no, it's fine. The, the, the profession, I think, is uh, just invaluable. Um, and go to those meetings. Get to know uh, your fellow colleagues. I love Geostrata of the magazine. Yeah, there you oh, go. See that? Yeah. <laughs> you, you know, I was going to say that the, we were talking about new research. There's a, one of the things I always think is so important. One of my graduate courses, I spent almost a half a semester on field test uh, interpretation of the results. You know, before you even do any design, what have you got out there in the field? What's the geology, what it's like. And they've got this new thing where you can do visual uh, you can uh, do virtual reality and look yes. at the profile of the soil. So really <laughs> wonderful. So I would encourage everybody to, I love the DFI. That's a wonderful organization. Well, as uh, ASCE, both of them uh, provide great support for young engineers. So do it, have fun, meet those people and talk dirt, you know, talk soils. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. It's been uh, <clears throat> many years now that I've been, you know, working as a geotechnical professional. And I can say that some of my best memories are being a part of these organizations, yeah, especially yeah. the two that you mentioned. Yeah, very unselfish All right. people, yeah. Well, thank you so much. We're gonna take a quick break here, and then we're gonna close out our talk with Professor Sam Clemens when we talk about the career factor of safety. Stick around. Welcome back, everyone. It's time for our career factor of safety end segment. In geotechnical engineering, just like many disciplines of engineering, it's important to incorporate a factor of safety into your design. But what about incorporating a factor of safety into your career? Today, of course, we're speaking with none other than Dr. Sam Clemens, and we're going to ask him just that. Professor, we spoke about you know, all that you've accomplished in your career. What advice would you give to those geotechs that are listening that are planning to transition into the academic route? They might be, you know, a master's student getting ready to get a PhD and then become a professor, or they might be working as a professional and say, you know, I want to go back and teach. How can they build security in their careers to give them a factor of safety when planning such a transition? Thank you, Jerry. That's a great question. And I'm so glad that you're posing that because we need good teachers. We need people committed and passionate about teaching. So it's really important thing to do. Um, I think the first thing is you, you have to realize that you may be poor for a while. It may, the transition may not be so easy. So be willing to have a little sacrifice there. I would say for, for young students, masters, PhD students, if at all possible, get out there and get some practical experience, six months, a year, whatever you can fit in uh, to sort of uh, underpin when you go into teaching. It'll, it'll serve you in so many ways for many, many years. For those people in the, in the mid-level mid or later that want to think about going into teaching, first thing I would do is volunteer at your local university or somewhere to be an adjunct professor. They won't pay you very much, I can guarantee you that, but you'll get a feel for what it's like to teach. Now, it's not exactly the way it'll be because if you do it full-time, it's completely different from just dropping in and doing it, you know, once a week or whatever. But 
if you, if you can find an adjunct position or if you can offer some seminars at ASCE or DFI, uh, try that and see if you enjoy doing it, if you like it. Then I uh, would take the step and you really do need your, your what we call your PhD card, your, or your union card, your PhD, <laughs> so that uh, it kind of ensures you, helps you along the tenure track and all that. Uh, and the first few years, it's a struggle. It may be a struggle financially, uh, but if you make some contacts with local consulting firms, you've got all this wonderful experience. If you're an older, a more mature person, or if you're a young person coming out, you've got some great research ideas. Hook up with those consulting firms and see if you can't serve them, help them, and use that during your time that you complete your education and start teaching. So please do it. We need people out there to get involved. All right. Thank you so much, Professor. Thank you for coming on and thank you for sharing such great insights with our yeah, listeners. Uh, we have a lot of information here and I'm sure our, sis, our you know, the listeners are going to want to hear more. What is the best way for them to find you? Uh, you're on social media or email you can share? Uh, LinkedIn, yeah, but I'm on, uh, my email is spclemen, S-P-C-L-E-M-N at S-Y-R Love to hear from anybody. Love to hear from people. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jared. I hope you enjoyed the episode today. We would love to hear your feedback, comments, or questions. Please feel free to go to our website, that being geotechnicalengineeringpodcast.com, where you'll find a summary of the key points discussed in today's episode, that being episode three, as well as links to any resources, websites, and books mentioned during this episode. Until next time, we wish you the very best in all your geotechnical engineering endeavors. Peace.